of course, thank you all for joining us. And we wanted to host this event um, as a rest restoration group to sort of clear up any of the confusion uh, that surrounds this issue right now. There's a lot of misinformation out there about the lawsuit, uh, especially at the Texas Supreme Court level, and some folks are, you know, kind of saying that this isn't going to really impact the land or what goes on in that land, and that's not the reality. This lawsuit does play a huge uh, part on what is going to be built in that space. So we have Amy, um, who is our amazing, amazing um, attorney and has been doing this work for free for the last couple of years. a lot of time, a lot of effort into this, um, and she's still doing it because it's not ending. Uh, so Amy's going to be clearing up some of the uh, questions that we might have. Just give us a quick update on what's going on. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so my day job is is teaching law. I'm a law school. So please forgive me. <laughs> the, um, if I get too law school-like, <laughs> throw something at me. But I, we did want to go over the history of the bridge um, and the history of the struggle to save the bridge as this important, you know, engineering cultural um, landmark for the east side and for all of San Antonio. So we wanted to look at the history, and that's what some of the slides we have. Um, then we wanted to go over the, um, the lawsuit and where we are. And, um, you know, I think the big picture, like why so many of us are in this struggle um, and, and think it's so important, um, is that it really is uh, a way to, to look at the ways in which our city government um, serves the wealthy and not the people. Um, and it's also, from a legal perspective, it, it, it shows and it, it reveals how, how many barriers there are to democracy or to, to the voice of the people as opposed to the voice of the wealthy. That's where we are today. And I think it's important to know that. And we're going to win this struggle. And along the way, we're going to learn a whole lot. and, and, and educate our neighbors a whole lot. So hopefully, we can get some better leadership. Um, everything about this case is about uh, anti-democratic um, uh, you know, assertion of power. So the, uh, so, so the deal is, the bathrooms are over there. There's all this coffee and food. Um, if you. Uh, if, I don't, if, if you have any questions as we go along, like it doesn't make sense what I'm saying, please, 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 you know, like stop or raise your hand or ask a question. That would be really helpful to me because uh, as those of you who know me, I get sick of my own voice really fast. <laughs> so it's helpful to, uh, um, to be able to engage. Yeah, that, yeah but, um, Please forgive me if you ask a question that's kind of about something that's going to come later. I'll say to you, can we leave that to later? So, so please don't feel offended if I do that. But please, please do feel free to interrupt at, at any point, and you know that would be great. I would be grateful for that. <laughs> okay. Anything else at the very as we start? Um, okay. The So, this bridge, a little history. Uh, this is the history that Doug Stanton uh, brought to us and many other railroad historians. Um, most of the bridge was built in 1881 out of wrought iron. And one of the unique things about it, it was brought to San Antonio to put in this place <clears throat> in 1910 because the railroad asked the city's permission to, to lay down those tracks that we now know are on the east side. And they were, by doing that, they were cutting off all of the roads that go from the east um, to downtown. And around 1910, I think the first um, automobile that was sold in San Antonio was in 1905. The first one that appeared there was in 1904. You know, so, so what you have in 1910 is people beginning to use a variety of different uh, means of transportation. There were already 
horse-drawn um, trolleys and buses that would go across those um, that, those streets. So, so to allow them to block all those streets, the city required that they place some <coughs> viaduct, that means just going from one place to another, across the, the, um, the tracks. So they took these two bridges from different places on the line that were built in the 1880s. Um, this one on the um, on our left hand side is a Pratt Truss, okay? Uh, very famous. The one called the Whipple Truss is one of the only Whipple Truss with a Phoenix column left in the country. Um, these were the first two designs for long span bridges. And the Whipple Truss was invented in, uh, I think it was patented in 1841, and the Pratt Truss in 1844. But these were some of the first span bridges that were built in the country or anywhere else. What um, Doug Stegman taught us is that it's the, the wrought iron construction. Bridges used to be all of wood, right, before these came around. And no engineers had figured out you know, the way the forces of weight interact. So these, the Whipple was the first person to use a scientific approach to measuring the way the weight affects um, the material. And, you know, the longer they got, the wood bridges would collapse. So there were a lot of very famous collapsing bridges in the mid 1800s. Um, so these bridges were among the first. They are the same technique as the Eiffel Tower built six years early. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the standing and importance of this bridge in terms of, of history and indeed in terms of the country. The Whipple Trust, this, thing, this idea of the Phoenix Columns, if you look to the right and the Whipple Trust is the upright, those were wrought iron but they were hollow. So they didn't, they weren't as heavy as all the others. And they are very famous, um, and that's one of the uh, things that, that makes this bridge one of the only remaining um, Wimble Trust bridges with a Phoenix column. So, okay, so very important. And you know, the conversation about the view of the bridge is this, this photo is taken from the corner of Cherry and Lamar. And this is the only remaining place on the sidewalk where you can see both the trusses. Once the bridge, once the apartment building, if it's built, it won't be able to be seen by anybody except people who live in the apartment building. And that's one of their marketing techniques. Well, and this one also gives you the skyline of San Antonio from the ground level, is I think the other. What, they went? That it gives you the skyline of San Antonio yeah. in the background yeah. for other Views. Other views don't give you that, yeah. But you can't really see, you know, you, when you walk around, you can't really see all the trust. Okay. Um, so uh, it was there, neither the city nor the railroad took care of it. The railroad said, okay, we'll put it up. The city said, you gotta put it up. So, so by the, by the um, 1980s, 1970s, it was really run down and it was getting dangerous and it was eventually um, closed in 1982. Um, this struggle was going on, there's a letter to the editor from Doug Stedman in, in 1967 about the bridge, okay? So, so one of the lessons is that, is that you, you know, these struggles don't happen within any of our lifetime. Right? I mean, the justice comes beyond uh, the human lifetime. Um, then in, 90s, in the 90s, so oh, this is his letter, yeah. As a native of San Antonio, I think the, the clean up and paid up for the hemisphere is a good slogan. However, I can't see how our city officials and our Chamber of Commerce can be satisfied with uh, this slogan when our Hay Street Bridge is becoming a death trap and is always so full of rubbish and broken bottles and has its railings deteriorating. I think the bridge should be painted and lighted up at night and kept clean, especially now that Hemisphere will soon be opening. Um, 51 years ago. Yeah. So then it was closed. Um, in the early 90s, 
Nettie Hinton coming back uh, to San Antonio after working for the federal government, um, learns that the city has plans to demolish the bridge and goes door to door on the east side with a petition seeking to save the bridge. Um, as Marcy said, by the end of the 90s, Gary Houston, Marcy Ince, and many others, uh, June Broucher, any of you know the Daisy Tours, a, a, a group of activists from the east side, but also from all over the city. Right? Um, Doug Stedman was, the, was a very uh, high-ranking engineer, the head of WD Sampson, is that right? Built the hemisphere and all of that stuff. So he was what we sometimes call one of the 17 white men that run the city, but then he started hanging out with with East Siders and with people, and uh, they started to treat him like dirt. Yeah, he's, he's a powerful person. All right, he just passed away um, two months ago. Um, his son has become active in the group and, and, and tells us that, that as Doug was dying, he continued to tell the story of the Hastry Bridge and, and said that, you know, those crooks stole our land. So they, the group got together, they did a study um, in March of 2001, and this is, a, this is the report that came out of the study. And what's highlighted is the fact that Bud Co. was vacating the east side location. All right? After tremendous opportunity, uh, another tremendous opportunity has emerged from Bud Co.'s announcement that they will be moving from their current location that spans on both sides of the History Bridge for a significantly larger campus. Establishing a line of communication between the city and the beer distributing giant could result in a funding source or deeded property as a public relations strategy. Okay, so this is, in other words, the land was early, early, early on. This is before we had funding from the federal government, part of the project. Um, the Hay Street Bridge Restoration Group um, identified sources of funding, helped to get um, um, engineers and other uh, uh, professionals to donate their services uh, essentially dragged the city into um, signing a funding application to the federal government. And am I accurate? There wasn't there wasn't a very much enthusiasm from the city. They wanted to demolish it. So uh, so the restoration group had to do all the work, and they got in 2001, a $2.8 million grant from the federal government under a program that's um, now ironically called uh, uh, a Fund for Trans Transportation Equity. So um, the city then was presented with a, uh, the question of whether they should accept this grant. And they said, well, if we accept the grant, we're going to have to pay out some city money and we don't want to do that. Because it's a, the way the grants work, you have to put up 20% and they give you 80%. So, so the city said, well, we might, we might not accept it because we don't want to give any money towards this project, right, the east side. So they required the restoration group to take on the burden of raising funds for the project, right? And in the paperwork, that they gave to the to the History Bridge group. The word funds, there is another paragraph that says funds can include in-kind land, it can include the uh, in-kind services, it can include any property that the city doesn't own at this moment. So, um, and in fact, at that time, in 2001, 2002, the plan was, first of all, they had to get Union Pacific to donate the bridge, because Union Pacific owned the bridge, and they had to get Union Pacific to donate the land underneath the bridge. And they planned to get the Dawson brothers, owners of Budco, to donate the plot of land that is adjacent to the bridge to serve as a, essentially a visiting center. Originally, the plan was to have a one of the old railroad um, stations relocated there, 
So there could be a kind of interactive exhibit about the railroad industry and the importance of the railroad industry both to uh, that part of, of the city and, and to all of San Antonio. And mysteriously, that was burned down. Um, and, um, but it was throughout the planning, um, it was understood that this was going to be part of the project. The language of this agreement with the restoration group, step back. This was written by the city attorney and the city planning office. And it was presented to the Hay Street Restoration Group as, we're not going to take the 2.8 million unless you sign this. There was some controversy within the group. Some of them thought it was a good idea. Some of them didn't. Eventually, they said, well, we're already doing this work. <laughs> We've already been having fundraising and solicitation events, we can do this and we are willing to take on that responsibility. So the piece of paper that they sign says that the group will be responsible for raising these funds, which include cash and in-kind donations. And in return, right, a contract goes both ways, in return, the city will promise that anything the restoration group generates will go to the Hay Street Bridge Project. We don't know exactly what that's going to be because that's the future, right? You're going to go out and solicit resources, but we promise that anything that you generate will go towards this bridge project. All right, so that's this famous piece of paper. Um, this is the layout. So now we're looking east from above. The Hastry Bridge is on our right. Lamar is on our left. Sherry is down the middle. And it's 1.691 acres. Um, so in 2004, pursuant to this agreement with the city, the restoration group uh, solicits Dawson. Um, and this is a letter to um, Malcolm Matthews, who is the Department of Parks and um, Recreation. And at that point, the arrangement was, and Marcy, you correct me on this, but and I, I found a couple of letters from you that I um, was looking at this morning, but um, basically the agreement was because the restoration group is like an unincorporated association. So they were working with the San Antonio Area Foundation. Any money gifts would go to the foundation for the Hay Street Bridge Project. And so when the um, Dawson land was talked about and they went and talked to the Dawsons and it was it was Marcy right and Nettie and that's it. yeah you went and sat with them and told them all about the project and they got excited and then you started to try to put it together and realized that the San Antonio Area Foundation wouldn't accept the donation right because it's land and not money they just do so what to do um, and eventually the bottom line is that the city agreed, verbally, handshake, we're working as partners, we will take the land and hold it for the restoration group until such time as the bridge is complete and the restoration group can raise the funds <laughs> to do the improvements to build um, a visitor center and um, parking facilities for school buses and restaurant facilities on the land. That was the deal. So. Um, everybody, these are all a bunch of documents. Marcia's on some. Um, throughout the documentation of the project, consistently the bridge and the land are linked together. So for example, there's an email from the city, one of the supervisors to one of his underlings who was working with the restoration group, and they said, where are we on the land for the uh, Hay Street Bridge project? And he responds, well, this was in 2007. Well, we already have the Cherry Street land, but we're still negotiating with Union Pacific to get the bridge and the land under the bridge. Okay, so, so clearly everybody understood that this was all included. Union Pacific was terrible to negotiate with, and the group had to do some of that as well. They, they 
didn't want to take care of the bridge, they didn't want anybody throwing anything on the tracks, they wanted so much, right? So it literally took uh, until the end of 2007, 2001, so six years of negotiating with Union Pacific. During that time, they'd also been negotiating, they also had, had already worked with Dawson's, and the Dawson's were ready to give the land and ready to make contributions. Um, but the city was holding off, and finally the Dawson said, look, in 2007, look, you either take it or we're gonna put it on the market and sell it. So we have testimony from um, Sheila McNeil, who was involved in um, that, at, at that moment, um, and Abigail, Tennyson, right, who was the head of the city's bike and hike family. So they said, well, what are we going to do? We don't have the bridge for the Union Pacific. We still really don't know whether they're going to give it to us. So they draft a deed where, this, where the Dawsons can transfer the land to the city for the Hay Street Bridge project. But it says, if the land is used as a park, we will call it the Dawson Park. Sheila McNeil was there in the room at City Hall when the word if was insert, inserted into that deed. And the reason for it, she testified, is that they didn't know if they would get the bridge. So clearly, if the bridge was never donated, they, the project would never go forward. But there was no thought that if the, if the project went forward, the, the, the land wouldn't be part of the project. It's clear. Yeah. So the if was only included for the bridge, like if the bridge was included, not if it was sold or if land was sold. Exactly. exactly, exactly. Needless to say, the city's made a whole lot of that if. Um, okay, so uh, the donation is completed in October of 2007. And it says, it authorizes the acceptance of a one-time donation for one parcel of land in connection with the Hay Street Bridge Restoration Project located in Council District 2. And then it says the idea for the project originated with a group of community activists, all right? So that is the document that the city approved in accepting this land. Um, and again, uh, the ordinance reflects that too. Amy, yes, me. I have a question. Yes, to clarify. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, with uh, Sheila McNeil, yeah, did she did she put that in writing? Yes, she. Well, um, the if and or first of all, she was a signer to the original memorandum of agreement. Right. She so she understood that part. She, um, she the. Um, deal with the city, both the, the city's agreement to hold it in trust yeah. and the insertion of the if was not in writing. Okay. Later, Sheila McNeil submitted an affidavit um, in, in the context of this lawsuit stating exactly what I said. Right, and are we in possession of that? And yeah. But somehow or another that helped, obviously, in my mind, helped the case at the Supreme Court? Uh, oh, yes. well, um, that we're going to get to in a minute. It okay. doesn't work. It doesn't help at the Supreme Court level, um, but it does. Know that it does either. help in that case. They're not that bright. <laughs> All right. So 2010, they finally have gotten the bridge from from um, Union Pacific, and they have finally done the restoration, and it is reopened on a wonderful day in July. And this is just a bit out of Nettie, Nettie Hinton's speech that day. We're here today to welcome the old lady, the Hay Street Bridge, back into the prominence she's always had in our hearts, even though some thought of her, of her to be an eyesore. Isn't she beautiful, and isn't the view of downtown wonderful? But folks, it's not over. The fat lady has not yet sung. We still have miles to go before we sleep. The restoration group will hit the fundraising trail. Again, we have a part to develop, so buy a Hay Street Bridge pin and be receptive to us when we start our funding process again to help uh, with the help of the Area Foundation. The Hay Street Bridge rocks, and who knows, maybe next year it'll rock and roll. <sighs> I wish. <laughs> okay, so Mr. Seymour, uh, Eugene Seymour was, was at the opening, and it looked good. Um, those of you who remember when Hartberger was mayor, there would be little, uh, like, um, how do 
packet of postcards from Hoiberger when he went sailing around the world. And um, often, in those little, little journal messages from Hoiberger, it, he would talk about his friend Eugene, who was with him, Eugene Seaborn. Um, I know Amy Hardberger and, and her sister, and they don't have any brothers. And you know, the, the understanding of everybody who knows the Hardbergers is that Seymour is the son that Phil Hardberger never had. And he's a man from uh, from California. Uh, what is what? Santa Ana. Santa Ana. That's right. He was born in Santa Ana, which makes him convinced that he. His destiny was to have Alamo beer. Um, <laughs> anyway, so he went to the opening. He bought property on two sides of the bridge, which is where he now has a parking lot and the brewery, the middle of the bridge. And then, uh, with the help of uh, Trey Jacobson, who was an aide to uh, Mayor Hardberger, and was hired as the principal lobbyist for Seymour, they made a bunch of backroom deals. Um, nobody knew about it in the spring of 2011, but they were lining up everybody in the city staff to support this. In fact, one person that we ran into had called this um, in the spring of 2011 and asked about this piece of land that's located next to the bridge, and they said, well, it's already been promised. Um, to, to somebody else. So, um, among the things they did was enlist um, future mayor Ivy Taylor, who was then council person from District 2, and she set them up with the Dignity Hill Neighborhood Association. Um, Mr. Juan Garcia, who was then president of the association, and they met secretly um, also, and so Seymour. Um, solicited and got the support of the people who were um, uh, important in the Dignity Hill Neighborhood Association at that time, still all, all without telling the Hay Street Restoration Group. The Hay Street Restoration Group was out raising funds for this development, and they were promising it to Seymour. The deal was a nice deal that wasn't offered to any other business people, right? And that was, you pay us $295,000, right? One of the things that, um, that um, Marcy wrote at the time was, hey, you're selling it to him for $295,000. That's what it was estimated to be worth in 2004, before there was a restored historic bridge next to it, all of that stuff. Anyway, it didn't matter because they promised to sell it to him for $295,000, and then they promised to give back to him whatever it was that he paid. So they could charge him $500,000 and he would still get $500,000 back. In other words, you know, for most of us that looks like a gift, right? You give me money and I'll give you the money back. In addition to getting the money back, he was going to get about one point, no, I'm sorry, about um, 900 here, I have it up here. Um, he would get $795,000 from um, reimbursed or waived property taxes. So this is the deal. Um, a sweetheart deal if there ever was one. In addition to this, he was given for free, no charge, the right to build a skywalk to the bridge, have a private restaurant set up all along the bridge, um, and use the land underneath the bridge for whatever he wanted. Okay? That's what they gave him in 2012, and that's why he's still on the books that he has a right to today. Um, so, this is uh, the terms of that ordinance. Um, later in the, this was, this, that was in August, beginning of August 2012. Later on, um, inquiry was made to the Federal Highway Administration who had provided the $2.8 million and said, well, is it going to be, a, you know, is it okay with you all if the city goes through with this project in which the bridge will be used for a private restaurant connected to 
a brewery that's going to be a craft beer brewery on the corner of Sherry and Lamar. And they wrote back and they said, no. You know, this is supposed to be for public use. And if you allow Seymour to have his restaurant on the bridge, you'll have to return the $2.8 million. Okay? The city didn't blink. Did they go and talk to Seymour and say, you know, maybe we can't do this? No. You know, they just figured they'd pay back the money because he's a good friend of Harper. <laughs> What? The sun. The sun that Harper remembered. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, this is what sweetheart deals look like. What? I never get those. Yeah. What? I never get those. I never. <laughs> nobody else was offered this. Nobody else even knew about it until it came out in the Okay. Can I have some water? <laughs> <laughs> So we, um, we kept asking about this letter, and they kept saying, oh, you know, they apparently had a meeting with the federal government, and the federal government didn't back down. So then by then, uh, um, let's see, this first started a, a, when, when Obama was in his first administration. So they were waiting for him to get defeated in his second term. Right? So they just sat around and waited. And then he got reelected. And then they started getting panicky because they didn't back down. So um, um, so they stalled and stalled and stalled. So here we are. They still haven't gotten an official change of policy from the Department of Transportation. But guess what? <laughs> I, I, I expect that there will be, <laughs> likely. But so, so we still have to watch for a, re a restaurant. Now, supposedly, this skywalk is going to be not to the brewery, because he's already built a brewery on um, Burnett and Lamar, going across, but to the apartment buildings. So the apartments are going to have an exclusive view of the bridge, and then they can have a skywalk over to a private restaurant. Um, at one point, Seymour had a community meeting. I think this was in about 2013. Um, and you know, the neighbors said, like, is this going to be one of those restaurants that's got white tablecloths and, you know, wine glasses and stuff really expensive? And he said, yeah, it's going to be a, you know, first grade, four star restaurant on the bridge. And they said, well, what about people who can't afford to go to those kind of restaurants? Seymour goes, not a problem, not a problem. I'm not going to leave out anybody. Everybody's going to be included. We're going to have, like, right under, under the bridge, we're going to have a hot dog stand. And, and you can bring your families to the, to the stand, and it'll be really nice. Okay? Segregation? No, good. What? Segregation. Yeah. <laughs> Something. I, but they, they're still, well, there is a truck, right? There are subtops. <laughs> so we filed suit in December of 2012. We didn't know it was his birthday. We, it, it was okay. We did. We filed on his birthday. Um, and we went to trial in July of 2014. Now, there's been a lot of misinformation about what the trial was about. And here's the, here's the truth. <coughs> we, filed, we filed the lawsuit with two claims. One was <coughs> under a state statute. It says, if the city has uh, public land that they're using for public land, and they decide to sell it, then um, if there is a petition by more than 3,000 residents, then they have to submit the question to a vote of the whole city. Okay? Um, this is a really important piece of legislation that has been slashed to almost meaningless status. Um, the same issue was there for the Hemisphere Park, right? Um, the idea comes from the idea that the city as a government does not own the streets or the sidewalks or the parks or the land that's in their name. They don't own it, they hold it for the public. Right? That is the understanding of the
the role of local government up until the Reagan revolution in the 1980s. Right? The idea was, and, and this statue was part of that. That is, if this is property that you're holding in trust for the people, then you can't sell it without the permission of the people. Right? So the original statutes like that said, you, you just can't do it unless you have a vote by everybody. You know, the Texas legislature cut back on that and they said, well, you don't have to have a vote. You have to have a petition first and then you have to have a vote, okay. Now, if you look at the statute, it is so filled with exceptions. If you are a city that has more than 3,000 people, that, but less than 1,000, 100,000 people, and you're located within 150 miles of the coast, then you don't have to have an election in order to sell. I mean, every city has gotten an exemption from this statute, just as the city of San Antonio did in order to um, sell off parts of the hemisphere park. Um, so, we had that claim. Did we feel good about that claim? Not really, you know. Once the city council failed so much to, to step up, we, could, we can't afford to put on a citywide election, right? We can't buy ads. That's not what we wanted. In addition, it was a class action, and our named plaintiff, um, Beatrice Valadez, was was ill on the day that we had the trial set after waiting for eight months. So our second claim was a breach of contract claim. And that was that the city made a deal and entered a contract with the restoration group. You must raise the funds, you must raise the resources, you must get donations, and in exchange, we promise that everything you raise will go to this project. That's really straightforward, right? I mean, it makes, okay. So that's what we went to trial emphasizing because we knew that that was our most, um, our strongest case and the opportunity that we would have to have specific performance, that is, have the city ordered to obey that um, contract, to live up to that contract. The city has made a huge amount by the fact that the jury found that this land was not held as a park. The reason they found that is we didn't push that claim at all. That's why, in reality, when the jury ruled in our favor, finding that the city had breached the contract, the city attorney was in the bathroom weeping. <laughs> um, and the next day, the city came out and said, we won. <laughs> okay. So. Breach of contract, <coughs> it was a week-long trial. We put on evidence similar to what you've seen that there was, an, there was an agreement, the land was donated, generated by the History Bridge Restoration Group, should have been put into the History Bridge Project. Um, <coughs> they did not argue at trial what they're arguing today, which is, well, it says that it has to be allocated to the budget that's been approved by the Texas Department of Transportation. That was never brought up at the trial. And in fact, the only evidence at the trial was that there never was a budget approved by the Texas Department of Education, I mean, tr tr of transportation, okay? What there was was a Hastry Bridge project. That's what everybody understood. I'm a contracts law professor, that's my specialty, <laughs> you know? Contracts are the agreement. They're not what's in writing. It's what people understand by the writing. And there was overwhelming evidence that the people who wrote the, the document understood it to mean that cash and in-kind donations would go to the Hay Street Bridge Project. All right? Overwhelming. And that's what the jury found. The jury found that that word meant cash and in-kind. And the jury found that the promise was to um, transfer the, um, or use the land for the history of the project. Okay, so, uh, and any argument that they could have made that somehow they sold the land and used it for the project was, was undermined by their own language that we just looked at, right? In other words, what did they do with the money when they sold it to Alamo Beer? 
They gave it back to them, right? They gave the money back to Seymour. Okay. So this is the um, verdict that, uh, or the judgment was, that was entered in September of 2014. Uh, that the uh, defendant city shall allocate, apply, and use all funds raised by the plaintiff of Haitian Bridge Restoration Group, including the property by applying said funds directly to the approved the city of San Antonio budget and for the Haitian Bridge. Okay. We were disappointed. Um, this was not the language that Canale said that he was going to put in the judgment. We feel like he took it out. Um, but it's fine. You know, we know what that means to the, to the parties. So we uh, then reached out to the city uh, to negotiate some kind of a, a implementation of the judgment. That's what you do, right? When you have a when you have a judgment, this is basically a judgment for ordering the city to do this. This was the time that Mayor Taylor became the temporary judge. I mean, temporary mayor. Yeah. Right. Um, the city attorney uh, Robbie Greenbloom, under Mayor Castro. Um, Castro was invited to go and join uh, the Obama administration, and Robbie was invited to go with him. So this is all happening between, you know, in the fall of 2014. So we're negotiating with Robbie and talking about how we're going to implement this um, this judgment, and he's meeting with us, and then he, he contacts us and he says, you know, I'm going to Washington. <clears throat> My last day is November 24th. Um, can we meet together and we'll talk to the, who's going to be the acting city attorney, Martha Cepeda. So we sat down with her and him, and we met and we talked about implementing this, um, this um, judgment. We talked about how we were going to do the fundraising and where we were going to place the visitor center and how it would be, how it would be implemented. Um, <coughs> So, we asked them, let's see, I that, uh, we said, Robbie, at that time, at that meeting, indicated that the city was willing to preserve the view shed of the historic bridge. We asked what department was involved in the economic development issues regarding the Alamo Beer Company, because after the judgment, the Alamo Beer Company started to go wild. Um, but, they already had their brewery built, okay? They brew, built their brewery on the Burnett land in 2013. So, uh, we asked what city department was involved, and the city didn't answer. We asked at the city center <coughs> development office, and they said no. We wanted to know who to talk to about how this land was gonna be treated. We, they had never allocated it to anybody, and we were desperately trying to write. Um, to find out who, who we should talk to. We were asked if there was any current proposal regarding the land at 803 North Cherry, and the city said no. Right. This is November 24th of 2014. They sent us a letter that was dated uh, November 26th, and it wasn't mailed until December um, 1st. It was received by me on December 4th, in the afternoon, and by that time, the city council had already voted to transfer the land to Al, not to Alamo Beer, right? no, I'm sorry. They voted to transfer the land to the Alamo Beer Company. All right, so. Well, and I want to be very clear, yeah. right? They could have told us this meeting was going to happen since we were meeting face to face with them. They sent that little notice. It came after the vote. The way we found out about this vote was somebody from the newspaper, from the Express News, was that you maybe? Called and said, what do you think that the city sold this land? And we're like, what? <laughs> we had no idea. Go ahead. There's another, there's another little party. I, yeah, I please, remember. I will. He, um, Eugene Seymour owned the property there on uh, you know, the Frederick building. Yeah. And it was, and we support, as yeah, conservation society, we oh. supported that trying to get it going, but it never did, as most of Eugene Seymour's projects have financially been a failure. Yeah. And so he couldn't do anything with it. He was going into bankruptcy. So that was actually the catalyst of why Harburger came and made this 
deal because I think the city took over the Burger Building. Yeah. I mean, it would, and and they also exchanged some city where the uh, San, San Antonio School District was, right? And the area too. It was a three-way. It was a. I mean, it was a more than a sweetheart deal, just giving them money. It was also taking this financial burden away. Away from, from them. From his godson. And yeah, so it was a, it was a lot. And they had money. Merchant Ice too, right? He had. I mean, those he had the he had Frederick Building and Merchant Ice. Both of which were heavily subsidized by the city. Both of which failed. He failed. Almost everything he has touched. Everything he touched. And he did own the land on you know on the adjacent the other side. He, he bought did. it after the bridge was reopened. Yeah, but, yeah. everything but he was did buy. It. But he did buy. It. That was his he did deal. buy it. And, but yeah. then it was the other side that uh, that they figured, oh, we can just give this to Eugene. You know, yeah. get out. You know, and we'll do the transfer. It was. A little more than just giving him money. It was no, they, they, thank you. Debt off of him. That makes well. sense. Yeah. So this land that was sold, is, we're talking about the actual lot now that the apartment. Yes, the actual lot that they were Sure. And and Lori Houston, who is the, who was at that time the director of the Center City Development um, Office. The office that we asked directly if they were involved, and the city directly said no. She testified to council that the Alba Beer Company, even though they already had their brewery, they needed this land at either Free North Cherry for brewery facilities and for parking in connection with the brewery. So that's why we should still give them the land, okay? And give them the money that they pay for the land. Yeah. You know, again, we're still at 295000 It's worth much more now. Um, and they, we talked to city council people who had met in executive session before this, and they were told that the city had won the lawsuit and was obligated to transfer this land to see them. That's so the city lied. What? So the city lied. So the city. city well, I think so. Yeah, I think so. I think the city. I think the city staff. There's no doubt that the city staff manipulated city council. Absolutely, absolutely. Even in public, because we have a videotape of Lori Houston saying, we need to give this land to Alamo Beer because they need it for the brewery and for parking facilities connected to the brewery. And then there was a question, well, are we giving them, this was a, what's the, anyway. Are we, we're not really giving them cash, right? We're, we're not giving them cash. Said, well, there is a $50,000 cash grant that we're giving but that's all. <laughs> so, within hours of the vote, the city manager's office signs a deed transferring the land not to the Alamo Beer Company, as the city council had authorized, but to the Seymour Texas Land Company, which is a wholly different entity. Well, they, they're all Harburger's son. <laughs> I mean, it was an unauthorized transfer of that property. That was why they lied to us about. They manipulated city council, and that, there it is. At the same time, city council reauthorized the skywalk, the restaurant on top of the bridge. The, the city staff did not tell the city council that they would have to pay back the $2.8 million. But they, 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 had a, they knew they would have to, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. But, We were very optimistic that Ivy Taylor would not be elected. <laughs> she promised she wouldn't run. Um, but she was, you know, this was her baby. She ran, you know. I believe that what ha I believe that what happened between our meeting on the November 24th uh, and December 4th was that uh, Mayor Taylor said, get this done. You know, I, I don't want to hear any shit. Just 
do it. Because this is the kind of, you know, you know super obvious um, uh, lying and manipulation um, by city staff. Okay, so then um, we filed, oh, we filed, that's the next step. <laughs> we filed a, a motion for contempt, okay, in December, right after they did this deal. What a motion for contempt is, is the city violated the judge's order, the judgment, okay? And the way we can enforce the judgment is by going back to the court and say, they disobeyed your order. We want this transfer invalidated, all right? That's what we said in December of 2014. We want this transfer invalidated. This is contempt of court. And the same day, the city filed a notice of appeal. So now we're getting law stuff. Does anybody have any questions you want to shake or anything? <laughs> No? You okay? I have a lot of questions. Yeah. Uh, so he got the three, the 295 that he paid was for where the brewery and the parking lot are now? Or was, is uh, that just? No. So I'm sorry I don't have a map. But um, here's the thing. Now I can do this. All right, so, so here's the bridge, like this, right? Uh, I can't draw either, so. Here's Cherry. This is Lamar, right? And Burnett is over here, right? So after the bridge reopened, he purchased this piece of property here and this piece of property here. Today, this is the Alamo Beer parking lot and this is the Alamo Beer brewery, okay? So this is how it was in 2014. He already had this built after threatening to block the view of downtown and everything else. He went ahead and built that. Okay. This was the piece of property that we're talking about, 803 North Cherry. And this is the piece of property where he originally wanted to put his brewery. So the skywalk would go over here and then they have restaurant tables here. All right. So the city council said, we're told, that even though they have this brewery, he still needs this land for the brewery, for facilities, storage, and parking, and stuff like that. So this is what they transferred to him. He paid, I don't know, let's see, who paid? Um, I believe, I don't know. We don't know whether any money was ever paid <coughs> to the city, but, this was transferred to the Seymour Texas Land Trust. Or land company, sorry. All right? And later in 2015, $295,000 check was written from the city to the Alamo Beer Company. Okay? And technically, the Alamo Beer Company and or Mr. Seymour has the right to build a skywalk to the bridge from whatever is here and put uh, tables on the bridge and have a restaurant. And he has a cash grant of 50000 waiting for him as soon as he decides to set up that restaurant. So that's where we are right now. Those licenses are in place. All right, so Appeal. Um, here's where the law comes in. The first thing that happens is there's an automatic stay. Okay, it's a suspension of the judgment. So what that means is if you're a government entity, and, and you have a judgment against you, and you appeal the judgment, it's automatically suspended. Nobody can enforce the judgment against the city. Okay? <clears throat> if you're a, not the government, you can't do that. You have to uh, put up money, you have, you're subject to uh, restrictions by the court and all that. Generally, the idea in the law is that once there's an appeal 
everything should stay the way it is when the judgment was entered. Which is only fair. Right? The person who won the judgment ought to just wait and see if the Court of Appeals appeal, uh, holds it. And the other side ought not to do anything to undermine the judgment. Okay? So that's how it was in after the city filed an appeal uh, in 2014. By the way, when we were talking to the city, mem city council members, and they said, well, we had to do this because uh, the city won the lawsuit. We said, well, if the city lo won the lawsuit, why did they appeal the decision? Right? Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Oh, my God. <laughs> Nuremberg said that. Shirley Gonzalez said that. Ray Saldana said that. Oh, oh, oh gosh, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So then we go to the Court of Appeals. And eventually, on March 1st, uh, 2017, um, March 2017, the Court of Appeals issues its de decision. The Court of Appeals says one thing about whether or not, well, like, whether or not the city breached the contract. I, I, I do say that at this point, the city's only argument was, well, this really wasn't a contract, it was a memorandum of understanding. And the, sit, the Court of Appeals on oral argument said, one of the judge, justices said, but is it a memorandum of understanding, an agreement? Well, yeah. yeah. Is it an agreement of contract? Well, 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 no, Your Honor, not in this case. You know. So the city really was, they almost laughed at the city for their one argument. But the Court of Appeals um, ruled that the city was immune from any legal liability for its breach of contract. Okay, so this is the idea of immunity. Okay, um, this idea comes from the idea of sovereign immunity, which is essentially the king can do no wrong. The king can do no wrong. In the United States, that means the government can do no wrong. Uh, this idea is very inconsistent with a democracy, <laughs> right? It's, it is just a novel. So, the, um, but it exists. And Nowadays, again, the city did not argue this. The city, uh, well, I can't say that. Okay. They didn't argue, they didn't, they put it in their brief, but they didn't argue it on oral argument. Um, uh, but it, it wasn't there. Um, so, uh, what's happened with something, with ideas in the law that are so on their face, kind of repugnant, what you do is you have judges trying to get around it or trying to promote it. There's, a, there's this whole kind of complexity in the law that comes out of stupid ideas, right? It's like the statute of frauds. There's just like there are five million books written about it. So immunity is really complex. Here's the short story, okay? Um, the city is not a king. The city does not have sovereignty. The state has sovereignty. So the idea is that the city is not immune unless the state uh, has, or unless they, they act on behalf of the state. Let me just that. Okay. If they act on behalf of the state, um, of the state, they are immune, okay? And essentially the law says the city acts on behalf of the state when it engages in governmental activities. Not when it engages in what they call proprietary, which basically means when it acts like a, like a business, when it acts like a, its own business, okay? So I'll just put business. Um, unless the state 
waves the, the so in other words, the shirt, okay, so if the city's acting like a government, they still are liable if the state waives the immunity. All right? If the city is acting like a business, they have no immunity. At the time we brought the suit, the Court of Appeals had ruled that the city, um, when it enters into a contract, is always acting as the government. So they always have immunity, according to the Fourth Court of Appeals, when they enter into a contract. And the only time that they don't have immunity is if the state waives the immunity. Okay. Now, like, I know this is really complicated, but bottom line, this is like a license for fraud. Right? In other words, if you're, the, if you're a city, you can enter into a contract. The other party has to perform. They have to do whatever work they're hired to do. And the city doesn't have to pay them. Right? Or if you're buying something from the city and you pay the city, they don't have to give you whatever it is that you're, you bought. All right? I mean, it's like, it's like it creates this big giant monster among us that gets to do whatever they want. Trump, by the way, really loves this doctrine. <laughs> It's fascism, right? So, but, but it's not really fascism, it's sovereignty. Nowadays, the justification for governmental immunity is that um, the government ought not to have to pay when their uh, employees or their representatives do harm to the community. That that's not fair to the government because the government is really all of the people and um, they say it's not, it's not a tort to be, to be a government, right, to govern. Um, it's, it's a really problematic idea. It doesn't hold up. You know, what it means, basically, is the government can do harm, and, and whoever they do harm to has to bear all of the injury on their own. All right, so we have, we did at that time, and we still do today, have a um, ordinance that says when the city enters into certain kind of contracts, even though they're acting in a governmental way, they are liable to a breach of contract action. It says a local government entity that is authorized by statute to enter into a contract that enters into a contract subject to the subject or Waive sovereign immunity to suit for the purpose of adjudicating a claim for breach of contract subject to the terms and conditions of this subcontract, of this subject. All right, so that's where we were in the Court of Appeals. We said this is a contract that's covered by this statute. And basically, the Court of Appeals agreed with that. However, the Court of Appeals said, this next provision says the total amount of money awarded in an adjudication brought against a local government entity for breach of contract is limited to the following. Okay. And the following are uh, the amount of money due under the contract and no, no consequential damages and no attorney's fees. Okay. We were seeking no money damages. Under contract law, please tell me if you're, if you're just hating what I'm doing. But anyway, <laughs> under contract law, you make a contract, you breach the contract. There are two forms of remedy. Either you have to pay damages to the, to the other side, or you are subject to an order of specific performance, which means you have to do what you promised. Those are the two different remedies. One is money, one is you gotta do what you promise. That's all, that's contract law, Texas contract law, everybody contract law, all right? We said, Judge, I know you're strange, but we did this because we want to help our community, <laughs> right? And first of all, the, the city said, it's no contract because you're not getting paid. And so we had to go through that. We argued and the district court said no, Actually, you can't have a contract even if you're not getting paid. All right? But here, 
the, the, the Court of Appeals said the total amount of money awarded in adjudication brought against a local government entity means that you have to bring a claim for money damages or else the government is immune. Um, there's, I, I, I think that they misread the words of the section. And it's, everybody that I've talked to that looks at it thinks so too, you know? But based on that interpretation, and based on the interpretation that the city is always acting as a part of the state when they enter into a contract, the Court of Appeals entered judgment saying the city's immune, the case is dismissed. All right? They may have made a contract, they may have reached it, but if you don't want money, too bad. We don't like people who work for nothing. <laughs> right? I mean, that's basically what it says. All right, so uh, this judgment, I mean, this decision was issued, but the judgment was never finalized because we appealed to the um, Texas Supreme Court. In the meantime, the Texas Supreme Court, in a case called Watson, ruled that the Fourth Court of Appeals was very wrong in saying that the city is always acting for the state whenever it enters the country. They said that's not right. Okay. The city is acting on its own behalf when it enters contracts for all sorts of things, when it buys staples for the office, when it buys pencils, when it hires fundraisers, right? <laughs> when it hires PR people, when it hires lawyers to handle the cases for breach of contract. They're not acting as representatives of the state of Texas. So the Supreme Court entered a judgment after the Court of Appeals ruled against us that basically says when the city enters into contracts where it's just for their own benefit, it's not because the state orders them to do it, then they don't have immunity, right? So, our appeal to the Texas Supreme Court, yeah. I got a question here. Yeah. So, in essence, it, 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 the state is saying, no, because that would make us liable for your bad behavior, right? More or less? Well, yes, but the state has immunity also. I hate that part. Okay. The, the state has immunity against any of this. Okay. So it's what the way they talk about it is it's the city is given, you know, is brought within the cloak of the state. Yeah. Of they, they become like a king. And and the the law for two hundred years has said that's not true. When cities act on their own, all a city is is a corporation. So there's a, it's really been interesting because in Texas, the legislature has given the governments all kinds of powers. The courts of appeals have been even more generous. And the Supreme Court for about 35 years has been trying desperately to get the legislature to stop expanding immunity. And I think that's why the Texas Supreme Court decided to take our case. Because this is another example of distorting a piece of legislation in order to give immunity. And the Texas Supreme Court, you know, I, they're, all, they're all Republicans. Uh, but from my reading, I, I, I have some faith that they have some integrity. Um, because they really have it. You know, well, I mean, Chief Justice Hatt. Really, he's issued opinions on this, and he says, this immunity is outrageous. The legislature, we call on you to act, you know, to make some sense of this and to stop passing the buck, right? So um, when we go to the Texas Supreme Court, we're going to say, first, that this was the city acting as a business, hiring fundraisers, and they're subject to a breach of contract action. 
All right? Next we're going to say, even if they were acting as a government, part of the state, that statute waives their immunity. So we are very confident, although anything can happen, that the Texas Supreme Court, when it hears this case in September or October, will decide at some point thereafter that the city doesn't have immunity. At that point, we go back to the district court and finally, we get to enforce our judgment and have a hearing on whether they breached the contract when they lied to us and manipulated the city council and gave the land away to Seymour. That's the first time we're gonna have a hearing on the merits. After the Court of Appeals ruled in their favor, the city began to try to change the status quo, right? That they tried to change the conditions so that the judgment would essentially be unenforceable eventually. After the Texas Supreme Court ruled that they would take our case on June 1st, the city and the developers and their supporters went crazy trying to get this building built on the land before the Texas Supreme Court gets a chance to rule. That's where we are today. All right? Among the things they said is that the Texas Supreme Court decision will have nothing to do with the land. Well, yeah, I mean, except that it'll say that you're not abused and that you have violated the judgment of the court. That's how this case relates directly to this proposed building. All right? And that was the picture of the building that's, that's proposed to be on the lot. So, that's why, and, and the city keeps putting out this false information, much like the Trump administration, believing that if they repeat it enough, people will believe it. And also in our city, we're, we're respectful people, right? If the authorities say it, it's got to be right. <laughs> it's not the, those people on the east side, those activists, right? So that's where we are. Yes. Um, I have no recollection of a contract um, for that property now from the Dawsons who gave it to us and then the city went to the Dawsons and said, no, no, give it to us. Did, was there ever a contract between the Dawsons and the city? No. Well, I've never seen one like that. No, there wasn't. But but what there was, the yeah, the city just stayed out of it. The restoration group negotiated with the um, Dawsons. Initially, we, after the Dawsons agreed enthusiastically, we went to the, um, or you all went, to the Alamo uh, Foundation, Area Foundation, and they said we can't take it. At that point is when Stedman and you all approached the city, Matthews, and said, will you all hold this trust? Because we wanted, the Dawsons wanted to get a tax deduction. We weren't a nonprofit, we weren't even a corporation. So that's why we went to the city. And, and Sheila McNeil, that council person, actually created the contract between the Dawsons, it wasn't even a contract, it was a deed from the Dawsons giving the land to the, um, to the city. And, and it, it was accompanied by a letter that said, thank you for taking all this on on behalf of the restoration group. And we're excited about the restoration group ability, group's ability to make this into uh, something that will ha enhance the public appreciation of the Hastry Bridge. So that's what happened. There isn't any other documentation. Um, does that make sense? Kind of, kind of. The reason why it's so convoluted is because the law has been manipulated by developers and corporations to erect barriers all the way along. You know, I feel like we're, feel like, we're like on this little type of, you know. Well, you know, they did this, can we can we get some remedy? Well, I don't know, there's this, you know, there's immunity, and then on this side there's a limitation on recovery, and then on this side is 
they get an automatic suspension and you know it's a, it is it is a system that is built to make it very difficult for a community organization and this organization is did and is doing exactly what anybody who talks about democracy says we ought to do right that's what's you know that's what's so important about this and other cases there's there's no room for democracy uh, you're demonized if you're, yeah, you're demonized if you're, yeah, if you speak up. So, any other, um, I hope it has a good time. Yeah, we got some questions? Make sense? I do, I, was, yes. I just want to clarify, right? Yes, please. Because, and I think this needs to be repeated more than once, a lot of people have said, and I know you already heard this out, but Go they've said, well, this lawsuit and whatever the Texas Supreme Court rules will have no impact on this development. Yeah. What is their response to that? Well, actually, it's, it's Mr. Jim McKnight, I think, from the very beginning. Well, yeah. The other piece I left out is um, early on in the lawsuit, Seymour sought to intervene, and he, he was represented by Cruz Shaw. Can we say that again? He <laughs> Cruz Shaw, who is now the councilman from District 2, was Eugene Seymour's attorney in this case. Oh, in this case. And when we go to council people and we say, do something about this. You have been manipulated. This is a fraudulent transaction. This is an irresponsible waste of public assets. They say, well, it's up to Mr. Cruz because, I mean, Mr. Shaw, because he's the council person and we have council privilege. So if it's in his district, he gets to say what he wants. And we say, well, even if he's working for the developer? Yeah. They say yes. Yes. Yeah. That's up to his own, between him and God. <laughs> okay. What, what else was it? <laughs> yeah, so, you, so what did you ask me? Oh, why did they say that? Here's the thing. So, so the developer's attorney, Jim McKnight, has said, initially what they said, after the Court of Appeals ruled, remember, up until when the Court of Appeals ruled, everything was uh, remained at the condition it was in before the judgment was in. But after the Court of Appeals, they started to speed things up to try to get this building built. At that time, James McKnight said, well, the case is dead. The case has already been dismissed. There is no case. All right? So guess what? He was wrong. <laughs> so then, then he said, oh, well, the case wasn't dead. It's going to be heard by the Texas Supreme Court, but it has nothing to do with this land. So you know what? That is no more true than when he said that the case is dead. And it's not just him. The city attorney's <coughs> office put out a press release saying the Texas Supreme Court case, not dead, but it has nothing to do with this land. You know, there's no, there's no, there's no reason why they would come to that conclusion except that they don't understand the case at all. I mean, I'm a little insulted because why would we be living? Why would we be doing all this stuff? <laughs> you know, somebody in the city said, "Oh, well, you're going to get paid. How's that going to work?" <laughs> you know, like, like, who's gonna pay? I mean, we're not asking for any money. How are you going to get paid? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. 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 Yeah. Thank you. Is, did you want to? Amy, I, I heard something today as as uh, as a part of doing the work on the west side, uh -huh. uh, learning about that most of our folks think that the city owns everything, <coughs> but I learned that the city only holds. Yes. And that's a really important word because some of our neighborhoods think that the ciudad owns everything. Yeah. No podemos hacer nada. We can't do anything. Yeah. But. Uh, thank you for uh, yeah. sharing, and I mean yeah. that's an eye opener for me. Yeah, today. thank you, thank you. Um, so I wanted to, what Jan, what what happened in between when the Court of Appeals decision came down in March of 2017, 
Um, they, um, the the uh, Eugene Seymour and Mitch Meyer created a company called the 803 North Cherry LLC. And then they filed a, um, a, an assumed name, which is the Bridge Apartments. And then um, the Texas, I mean, the Seymour Texas Land Company, who you remember is actually the owner of that property, never was an owner, um, transferred the land to the ownership of the 803 North Cherry um, LLC. Okay, this is another legal issue, but um, now they say, poor us, you're talking about invalidating the transfer of the land to Seymour, but we're the owners. You can't take it away from us. And our response is, you're, you are Eugene Seymour, and he did not uh, innocently come to this, uh, and he's not surprised that we oh, don't think the valid. transfer was valid. Yeah. Uh, under the law, if you are a quote, bona fide purchaser, that means you buy land that was somebody else's dispute, you're protected. You know, if you didn't know anything about it, you paid money for it, they can't take that land away from you. But if you knew about the dispute, <laughs> you didn't pay for it, and you, you are subject to the pre-existing dispute. So both Seymour and the 803 North Cherry and the Seymour Texas Land Corporation and Mitch Meyer all are not bona fide purchasers. Because they knew. Because they absolutely, they decided to go forward knowing full well that we had already filed a claim saying that that transfer was invalid and seeking to invalidate. So they don't have any claim whatsoever. Yeah. Wait, wait, you haven't answered your question. Oh, I didn't answer your question. I'm sorry, wait, let me do it again. Okay, so, um, after the Court of Appeals decision, they created these companies, they transferred the land to the 803 North Cherry, and 803 North Cherry submitted an application seeking approval for a um, apartment building to be built on that land that would entirely block the bridge, but would have beautiful views of the bridge available for the residents, right? And um, they, because it's in the downtown district, they have to get approval from the Historic Re Design and Review Commission. And the Historic Design and Review Commission, in three separate hearings, said, this is not consistent with the guidelines that we're supposed to apply. This is um, too big, too high, doesn't have any connection to the neighborhood, which is a historic district. It's not approved, no. Okay. The last time they did that was in March, and on March 23rd, the um, city manager said, well, I reject, I'm going to overrule the Hay Street Bridge, uh, I mean the Historic Design and Review Commission. Moreover, I am announcing that we have already promised the development $1.2 million <coughs> in seed chip money, which is a housing subsidy, uh, and it doesn't have to be low income housing, it's for rich people to be able to live in those apartments. So um, the city manager said, all I ask, I will give you approval, you will, and once you get my approval, you can get your building permit and start to build. However, the developer has to make some changes to the plan. He has to move it back a little bit from the bridge. He has to um, allow the public access to the land under the bridge. And he has to uh, make a variety of other changes. And the um, Dignity Hill Neighborhood Association Architectural Review Committee has to sit down with the developer and negotiate these changes. 
that he has to make. Otherwise, I won't issue the opinion. And he also has to go to the HDRC and get their opinion. Okay. So the next thing that happened was the new president of the Dignity Hill Association, who is an ally of uh, Eugene Seymour and Mitch Meyer, uh, disbanded the entire architecture review committee and, um, and said, there is no architectural review committee. I, am, I will appoint uh, Juan Garcia to be the new chair of the architectural review committee. And you all remember Juan Garcia, he's the one who did the backroom deal with Ivy Taylor in 2012. So, oh, good. <laughs> sounds, like, yeah. sounds like it's gonna win in our favor. Yeah. Um, he also said that he won't appoint anybody to the, to the committee until later, uh, a month or two from that. Um, after the Texas Supreme Court uh, announced on June 1st that they would um, take uh, this case, the new president of the New Women Health Association issued a letter saying, our new art committee, which is me and a couple of other people, hereby approve all of the uh, decisions that the developers have made, which is that they won't comply with the conditions put down by the city manager. And they think that the condition, they do. so for example, where the city manager says he must move the building away from the bridge, Mr. Uh, Burrow, who's the new head of the Dignity Hill Association, says, we don't think that's a good idea. So we hereby have agreed with the developers that they can do whatever they want. They can leave it where it is. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, so that's what's happened within days of this Texas report. And apparently the uh, Office of, of Historic Preservation called a meeting of the uh, Design Review Committee of the Historic Design and Review Commission. And they also said, well, it's okay whatever they want to do. We don't think that the city's manager's conditions should be required. So um, that's where we are. On last Friday, not yesterday, but a week ago Friday, we filed a motion in the district court saying to the court, look, the city is stumbling around trying to get a building put on that land before the Supreme Court gets a chance to rule on this case. And that's wrong. That's not fair. And we asked the district court to impose conditions on this automatic suspension of the judgment. All right? So we asked that we were assigned to Judge uh, Laura Salinas and had a her hearing before her. And we asked her to, to put a condition, which she is entitled to do, that the city not issue any more approvals for this project, any building permits at all, um, for this project until the Supreme Court gets a chance to decide the case. And that is a condition of the suspension of judgment. We also asked that, that she order, or that she <coughs> impose a condition saying that the city must issue a stop work order uh, in case there have been some approvals issued that we don't know about. Yes? Um, well, uh, about no. six uh, fancy lawyers showed up in court, um, and and the city argued that um, that we were trying to um, change the judgment, bring in a new case, open the uh, the <coughs> trial. They won the case. Um, the um, order of specific performance shouldn't be enforced because of government. They just like said everything. And um, it's now been a week and uh, Judge Salinas hasn't issued a, a order. I understand that Ineth uh, called the court. Yeah, I did. I called them yesterday. What did they say? Um, to see if they had any 
response or she made some sort of ruling on Friday, uh, Friday's hearing and they didn't have an answer. The advice that I, I called back on Wednesday and by Wednesday, her clerk guaranteed that she should make a decision. What? Yeah, by Wednesday. But there would be a decision on our so motion. Is that she up for re-election? Yeah. She uh, did have called yesterday. <coughs> what is she up for re-election? Yeah. Well, there folks, were like 35 and 38 people there. Yeah. What made me think twice? A lot of people have, you know, shared that she is a bit of a more fair judge, and she does tend to look at cases like a little bit closer and um, maybe it's just more compassionate. And I, I, you know, we have hope. Fingers crossed. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're asking more than what a usual case would ask, but but all we're really asking for is that things remain the same so that the appeal process can go on. I, you know, I, I just want to stress to the group how grateful and thankful we are for Amy. Oh, oh thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> oh,